What's up guys, welcome back to another GGA video review and today we'll be taking a look at the brand new Corsair 9000D Airflow. Now for you guys who are familiar with the 1000D, this case is an absolute monster and you can probably see going by the size of the box itself. Now in this review, I'm going to go over everything you need to know about the water cooling. Of course for those water cooling enthusiasts, this case is going to be definitely aimed towards you. I'll also cover some of the new changes. Now some things that have stayed the same, the external design element is very similar. Most of the tooling for that is the same, but they have some new updated features like the Infini rails they're calling for the water cooling support. There's now back connect support, new cable grommets, and there's a new 360 fan mounts on the back up the top. So let's jump in and get started. When I first saw the 9000D at Computex earlier this year, I actually had to take a second look at what I was seeing, as I never thought I'd see another super tower hit the market. Just to get things clear, the 9000D is a refresh to the ever so popular 1000D. The overall chassis dimensions, internal structure, and most of the tooling has stayed the same. But what we do get with the 9000D are some external changes for improved airflow. That big front tempered glass panel has now been removed with an equally large mesh panel that is much easier to remove. Also, the amount of room between this panel is just insane, although air can just go straight through anyway. The top panel is vented for much better exhaust. Improvements have been made to the radiator rails at both the front and the top, which Corsair call their Infini rails. 120, 140, and even 200 mm radiator sizes are supported out of the box. No extra brackets are required to be purchased. I'll cover all the radiator options later on in this review. IQ Link is also supported out of the box with the inclusion of a Corsair system hub. Also, internally we find full support for back connect motherboards, as well as updated cable grommets, which Corsair are calling double shot, which are basically impossible to fall out. The 9000D comes in at 697 high, 305 wide, and 697 long. Unfortunately, I don't have a V3000 Plus on hand, but the 9000D is a fraction larger all round. Another bonus is now the 9000D comes in either black or white color options. Panels are detached and installed in their own boxes separately within the main box. I like this as it would make the chassis ship more safely and also makes the case much lighter when removing from the box. Side panel tint on the white is 100% clear, but unfortunately I do not have the black variant, but from what I can remember at Computex, it was about a medium tint. Rear side panel is now steel, which I prefer over the tempered glass. A single 360 cutout can be found along the top for the new 360 radiator mount. And both side panels stay closed via magnets, are both removable, but can be locked down via a screw on the hinge. As the chassis is so heavy, I do recommend removing both side panels before moving the case, as this will drop about 10 kilograms off the overall weight. Moving on to the front IO, and this may look the same, but the implementation behind this is different. Instead of all the USB and audio being broken up, into their dedicated cables, the whole I.O. is now a USB hub, and the only required cable for USB and audio is a Type-C connection back to the motherboard. This will then give you four USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C ports, headphone and microphone ports via a built-in DAC included in the hub. I think this is a huge game changer, providing the bandwidth is there, but in saying that, most of the time front panel is used for peripherals, and I'd keep high-speed storage to the rear because now we've gone from five cables for USB and audio down to one. The only other two cables are for front panel power and reset headers and SATA power for the RGB illumination around these ports. And it doesn't stop there. The 9000D comes included with the system link hub, which gives us some RGB control on the case. Two arrows will pop up in Corsair's IQ. The front AO port illumination has 18 individual LEDs that can be controlled. And the very front center Corsair logo has four individual LEDs that can be controlled as well. The only thing I would have loved to have seen was the Corsair System Link Hub somehow being fed into the front IR USB hub instead of needing its own internal USB cable to connect, but maybe there was a USB limitation somewhere that was limiting this. Five mesh dust filters can be found, two small funky ones can be found that cover a variety of different length PSUs, two large slide out filters can be found that cover each of the Infini rails, while one last magnetic dust filter is on the inside of the back panel that covers that 360 fan or radiator spot. Moving inside the 9000D, and any of you 1000D owners watching will be very familiar with this layout. We do still find dual system support on this chassis, where an ITX motherboard is supported on top of the PSU shroud, and its mating SFF PSU goes around the back at the bottom. Some new changes we find are cover panels to help run cables from the front of the chassis over to the back. This would most likely be used to help cable manage front fan cables, and we can see some cables are already in these channels. Motherboard support is of course going to be up to just about anything you can imagine, and with the double row, well actually triple row of cable grommets, if you include the right angle ones at the front, 
I can assure you, you won't be covering your 24 pin cutout in this chassis. Currently I have the TRX50 Aero installed, and although it doesn't look very large, this board is EATX. There's actually that much room next to this board that even a larger board clears this space. Going up a size with the TRX50 Sage, we still have plenty of room and that's the largest board I have on hand to test, but SSI EEB is supported in the 9000D and we can see the standoff for that form factor to the right. Back connect motherboards are now supported in the 9000D and I had no issues with my test tough Z790 BTF, MSI Z790 Project Zero or my Aorus B650 Stealth Ice and there's a whopping 65mm of clearance behind the motherboard for cable routing. Double shot cable grommets are all over the case, you'll find 6 directly next to the motherboard, 4 on the top ledge for EPS and other top motherboard IO cables, 4 more on the front ledge of the motherboard tray, 1 under the motherboard for fans and front power reset cables, and a last grommet can be found on the PSU shroud for when using an ITX motherboard. I would say these grommets are some of the best I've tested. The outside room is firm and really stays in place while the middle is much softer. GPU clearances will have no issues at all for both length and width. Here is a Gigabyte Aero 4080 and this card is one of the largest I have. An anti-save bracket is included and can be installed in two locations depending on your motherboard size. For EHX boards and larger, it needs to be removed and moved over to the furthest location. This bracket is simple and worked well. Corsair also provides a vertical GPU bracket, but this just converts the rear PCI area from horizontal to vertical. But for this, you'll still need your own riser cable. As this bracket has no bus support, I did find my test GPU saved quite a bit. This could be rectified by a small stand on top of the hard drive cage, or if you're serious about running your GPU vertically, maybe a third party option might be better as there is plenty of room in this area to do so. Primary PSU location is found at the bottom under the PSU shroud. The shroud needs to be removed first via two thumb screws, one at the back and one at the rear before installing your PSU. The PSU shroud is 280mm long, so I'll keep your PSU length to 240mm or less. Anything over, cable clearance will start to get tight. You can always remove the PSU shroud if not running the secondary ITX system. For example, my test Corsair AX1600i is only 200mm long, giving me about 80mm left for cable clearance. For anyone looking at going down the dual system route, you'll need to remove the rear cover plate at the back that covers the second system rear I.O. Once removing this, this also opens up the secondary PSU location to mount your SFF power supply. If going with a secondary ITX system, one thing to note is this will most likely need to be custom looped. Due to the layout and available size, there is only room for a two slot GPU, so don't expect anything too high end down here unless it's water blocked. Power and reset buttons for the secondary system is still in the same spot, which is up the back at the top. Corsair now include an external port cutout for future supported linked devices. Around the back for storage, things pretty much stay the same. All backside access is found behind two swing out button doors. These are held in by magnets only, so be mindful that any protruding cables will cause these doors to pop open. But with the amount of room back here, I can't see there being any issues. Each door holds three 2.5 inch SSDs on removable sleds for a total of six SSDs. You'll also notice an extra spot is available on each side, while five 3.5 inch hard drives can be installed into the bottom hard drive cage. These cages can also take five 2.5 inch SSDs instead of hard drives. This hard drive cage can also be removed completely if not needed, but this cage does hold a pump res bracket at the top, so be mindful if going with the custom loop. For rear cable management, there is so much room back here and plenty of cable tie downs can be found. I can't really see there being any issues, but I'll go over this again at the end of the video once I've completed my build. For custom water cooling, the 9000D can support many radiator standards straight out of the box. 120, 140, and even 200mm. Corsair have updated the radiator rail system, which they are now calling InfiniRail. The way this is done is via a modular mounting system. Fan sizes are labeled along the top and the bottom for the corresponding setup you decide to go with. This is a little bit confusing at first, as multiple fan sizes are labeled multiple times. This is because you can have, say, a 420 radiator more to the left side, or in the center, or further to the right back side. This applies to 120 and even 200mm rad sizes as well, as unlike in traditional cases, the radiator position isn't fixed. To slide out the InfiniRail system, we first need to undo the thumbscrew that locks both top and front rails in place. Then I find it best to give it a slight pull at each end until it pops out. Then we can slide all the way out from the middle. Mounting fans and rads onto the rail system is done via these sliding plastic clips. These can be removed if not all of them are needed, and extras are supplied in the accessory box if more are required. As these slide and don't lock by themselves, Corsair provides locking T-nuts. For a 480 setup, 
you don't really need these as being so long, the radiator extends the full length of the rail system. But say you went with the 420 or dual 360s in the front and wanted the radiator centered vertically without these T-nuts, the radiator would just slide down. For the top, you don't really need these T-nuts as the plastic clips don't slide that easy with the radiator being horizontal. When it came to mounting radiators, I found it best to completely remove the rail system by sliding the release tab at the top and the bottom. Then radiators can be mounted outside the case on a table, then the whole assembly can be slid back in. The default is set up for two rows of 120mm size radiators, which is up to 480s. This is the same for both the front and top infinity rails. Note that this is the only config on the rail system that can be run dual side by side. One important part I want to point out first is with how the rail system is designed. By default, the plastic clips are installed for fans to go down first, then the radiator. The only radiators that managed to fit inside this gap without the need of fans first were Corsair's own radiators, which are the older Black Ice Nemesis L series, and they also needed to be 360 or less to fit. 480s were too long to fit inside. But what we can do is undo each part of the rail, slide these clips out, and flip them around. Now these sit flush with the rails, and the rails can be installed first, then the fans. Radiator clearance for the front infinity rail with the plastic clips in the default position is 120mm to the hard drive cage or to the right angle cable grommet part. That's enough for two 60mm thick radiators with a push-pull fan combo. If you don't want fans first and flip the clips around, you will lose roughly 15mm of that 120mm clearance. The top radiator clearance, this only really applies to those wanting to run 480s at the front and 480s at the top, as there are going to be some clearance issues here. For 360s and lower, no issues at all as there's a whopping 150mm here to play with. If going quad 480 radiators with my test Corsair Hydrax series XR7 480 in its upright position and the top rail clips in their default position, I had exactly 60mm of clearance here. This was just enough to fit a Hydro Labs Black Ice 480 GTS with fans at the top on the inside of the rails. I had to use Hydro Labs 480s here because Corsair did not have 480s in slims. If you prefer the fans on the underside of the radiator for a push config, we can flip the front 480s around so the ports are at the bottom. Then flip the top infinity rail clips over and mount the 480s directly to the rail system, then the fans. For my rads, I did have to remove this little indicator part for the radiators to mount flush. The 9000D now includes a 360 radiator or fan spot above the motherboard on the back panel. This will have limited use and cannot be used in conjunction when dual radiators are used at the top. This would come in handy for say an AIO build or if a single radiator is used along the top, or even something cool like a flat reservoir. The final location is at the rear, and this spot holds up to a 240mm radiator, providing fans go first, or a single 140mm fans if going with 360s at the top and push to the front. If you have 480s along the top, there was no chance a 240 radiator was going to fit here at the same time. Only fans will fit in this area. Alrighty guys, before we wrap this video up, let's take a look at the final build.
Now, as you can see, this system is an absolute beast, and I'll talk a little bit more about all of the hardware I used in this system. Now, just a few things before I wrap this review up. Now, that rear 240 spot, it looks like there's a lot of room, but once you get everything in there, it is a bit tight for a 240 radiator, so that's probably best to be used if you are running an ITX system down below. You can run a 240 all-in-one cooler. Now, 240 rads on all-in-one coolers are smaller than rads for a custom loop. They're normally typically bigger, so you can uh, run one of those upside down. The tubes can come out, and that'll be a good solution for that. Now, I didn't really cover red support, mainly because there are a lot of options you can go with. Uh, we've got all of the rad spots. You can put something like those flat reservoirs, something really cool that I don't think would be available on any other case on the market is with the dual 120 spots. Normally in a chassis, you'll have your red outer spot at the front, red outer spot at the bottom, red outer spot at the top. Now we have two at the front. We can do a rad fan combo on say the backside at the front. And this gives, this gives us a whole 480 spot on the sort of the main side on the front. So we can do some really cool options like a 480 on the backside with fans. Then we can go like a 360 FLT and a 120, or I believe Alpha Cooler bringing out that 480 uh, flat reservoir. That'll look sweet on that side. And you are still bringing in intake air through that one rad, or you can just have fans. Because in a traditional case, you would be blocking all of your intake if you were going with a front reservoir, because normally you're, you only have one spot. So you can play around with, you can even do like two 240s. I didn't have two 240s, unfortunately. I only had a 360 and a 120, so that gives you the 480. You've got the option on the backside, although that is very tight. Obviously with doing the dual 120s at the top, you cannot fit anything. I can't even fit fans on that back 360 spot. So if you had something like a 420 centered in the middle, you could do that. If you had a 120 on this side, or a uh, even a 200, you would have room. And then of course, you've got the default spot here. Now, this is a little bit confusing because on the Corsair product images, they have two uh, pump res combos, just like I've done here. I thought, sweet, I'll do exactly the same. But this removable bracket here, which is designed for a pump res combo, it can fit a lot of brands. It's got a lot of holes, a lot of generic holes, and it also have holes for their standard pump res combo, but it will only fit one in the very center. Now they had two. I was able to manage to fit two because I just got the uh, inner two holes to line up on this one, these two holes to line up on this one, and the outer two holes are kind of right on the edge. There's nothing holding them in. I did stick a, a bit of strong double-sided tape on the edge to hold them in. And then once you have it all mounted together, they aren't really going anywhere. So just bear in mind, if you do see uh, some images rocking two, or if you see this video now, I'm rocking two, you will have to do a slight little bit of modding to get it to work, but it does work okay. So I just wanted to point that out. And another thing I came across, I did spend a few hours trying to work out this. Now, you also may see on the Corsair product images, they're running two of their XD5, the Elite LCD pump res combos, like I've done here, LCD, LCD, but IQ only supports one of these pump res combos. When I mean one, it supports it all fully. It just only supports one LCD. When the uh, second one is running or you have two running, the second screen just flickers like mad. So I reached out to them and yes, they know that's an issue. They're gonna look into it and hopefully we can fix that because I was like, hey, sweet. I could have like CPU temps, everything related to CPU on one, everything related on to GPU on the other, but unfortunately I couldn't. So the way around that, you can turn a lot of their devices into a hardware mode where you can offload data to the devices themselves and you can essentially just unplug the USB. So what I did is by default, when you have these set up without the USB, they're just uh, set to liquid temp. So instead of having liquid temp just on both of them, that'll bypass the flickering. It's only when you want to uh, run the USB and configure the screens, that's when they start to flicker. So I had set one to liquid temp and then the other I just set to a static uh, Corsair logo. And by offloading one of them to hardware mode, that image was set and then the other one was liquid temp. So unfortunately, you can't do too much customization if you are running two together. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, another area I didn't really cover are all of the different radiator options. I mainly covered the 120 support and then the different, uh, I would say the different clearance options for the front and also the height. But there are so many options you can play with on this case. I would have been here for days and this video is probably going to be long enough already. But um, I got some shots of some funky 
are 400 millimeter alpha cool rads. So they're essentially two by 200 millimeters. So I've got two fans at the front, two fans at the top. And one advantage on going with the larger fans is they're going to be much more silent and they're still very, very powerful. And the performance is there for such large fans. I had some Noctua ones. They are basically inaudible, but they push a huge amount of air. So if you want a really silent setup, the only issue with going with uh, weird non-standard radiator sizes is you're probably not gonna find them in white. Even trying to find 480 radiators in this size in white was very hard. Even uh, Corsair don't do 480s, any 480s in white, which would be good if they could do that. But yeah, I played around with some dual 400s. You can do like dual uh, 480s at the front. You can do 420 in the center, and then you could also do the 360 on the back. So it's really unlimited on what you can play around with. Now, rear cable management, I always have to cover it then. No issues at all. I've got the main side panel closed, those barn doors closed as well. Those barn doors can be removed as well. You don't have to have them on there. If you're not running any SSDs, you probably don't really need those uh, two back doors on there anyway, because the side panel will close and clean up anything that you don't want to see. But yeah, no issues with that. I ended up running uh, two system hubs from Corsair. The case does have one. Although IQ Link can now support 24 devices, I just ran two uh, just to make sure because I'm pretty close to 24 devices. So I ran two just to make sure. Uh, I've got the dual GPUs, a heap of cables. It is a little bit messy down the bottom, but that's expected on such a large build like this. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the secondary ITX system. I did don't want to mislead anyone where I said that you will have to go with a water block system only. You don't have to. A good option you could do with a case like this being dual system, you can have like a gaming setup on your main one. Of course, you can fit any size GPUs, but on the second one, you could have a dedicated streaming setup. So a lot of streamers run two systems so they can offload the stream onto a dedicated PC that doesn't affect their main gaming one. And that'll be perfect for like an Elgato capture card, something like that, which will fit in the two slots. So I don't think that you have to go with a water block GPU in the system if you're not using it for a gaming PC. Now for all-in-one cooler support, I didn't touch base on that before because I don't really think that was too relevant for this case. Like, so yes, you can do it. The only spots are gonna be at the top here and then at the back. And of course there's 240 here for, I guess you could use the 240 for your main system. That would be pretty ridiculous in this case. But the 240 for the ITX, 420 at the front, isn't really going to reach for the tubing unless you have some non-standard all-in-one cooler that has exceptional long uh, tubing but the back 360 will reach and then obviously if you run the ports coming out the back side that'll reach your cpu and then the front is completely out of the question for running an all-in-one cooler because there's no way that'll be able to reach but yeah i had no issues fitting in 420 360 it just has to be at the top or at that back 360 spot uh one thing i do want to cover uh actually one thing before i want to mention the secondary itx system now that the front IO for the chassis is now one USB hub with that single type C. So I've plugged one single type C in and that has connected all the USB, all the audio through that hub. If you do run a secondary ITX system, you will lose any front uh, USB for that. So normally when you have dual systems, normally you can split up which USB you want for your system. You have normally two USB A for your primary, two USB A for the secondary, and then you split uh, one type C, one type C for each one. But now being dedicated for the primary, you will lose that. Like you could plug that into the secondary um, and you would have no primary, but you can only have one or the other. Now, one thing I do want to mention are the little plastic clips. Unfortunately, I can't really pull this out because it's all hard tubed in, but those little plastic clips that hold the radiators in. Now, at first I thought, well, a bit risky going with plastic clips. I did think they were going to be fragile, but because you can use so many of them to hold into a rad, I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight for each rad. I could even use more. I didn't need to uh, use every single screw hole on a radiator. You don't have to. So I just used uh, the primary ones. But at first I thought they might snap, they might be fragile, but I have probably installed radiators, I would say about 40 times in this case, and I had no issues with any of the clips. They worked fine. The only thing that might be a bit of an issue is the clips are a little bit thicker than a traditional steel case. So normally when you uh, go through the, say a front panel of the case into fans or into fans and a radiator, the thickness of the steel is very, very thin. It's something like one or two mil. These clips are over that. They're probably at least I would say five, six mil. So if you get a radiator that comes with screws that aren't that long, if it's just enough to go through a case, 
and then bite into the radiator through the fans. You may find you might have to look at some aftermarket screws for that. Um, in terms of any issues with the radiators with the clips now, I tested a lot of different radiators. I didn't really show it on film, but I wanted to see if there were going to be any issues running dual 120 side by side. So I tested EK's latest rads, they worked. I tested Alpha Cool rads, they worked. The Corsair Hardware Labs Nemesis L rads, they worked running 2480 side by side. The only ones that had issues, believe it or not, were these rads I was running with. Now these hardware, these are the Black Ice uh, GTR. I believe that the GTR or the GTX, I'm pretty sure they're the same uh, dimensions, but they were too fat side by side. So when you put them down side by side, the center plastic clips didn't reach the two screw holes for each one. So to fix that, I just had to drill out or just ream out a little bit more of the hole to make it fit because these rads are very, very wide and the screw holes aren't that close to the edge. They're actually more further into the edge of the radiator. So I just wanted to mention that out. If you do want to replicate this and go with these Hardware Labs radiators, I mentioned no uh, broken clips. One thing that does come with this case is I'm not sure if anyone else has done this, but Corsair have invented a new type of fan screws that Corsair are calling Quick Turn. You get a bunch of these, probably not to deck out everything in this case, because you're probably going to go with radiators and fan screws are no good for radiators. But yep, they're calling them Quick Turn fan screws. Now a traditional uh, fan screw, I don't know how many years these have been around, probably day one, they've never changed. They have a meaty thread that is very bunched up and it goes around the screw a lot of times. Now these ones have been pulled apart and the thread only goes around, I would say about once or twice. So it's just a very narrow uh, thread and you go to screw it in and you literally have to do half a turn and it's in. Next fan, half a turn and it's in. So I don't know if that's uh, interesting to anyone, but I think it's a bit of a game changer. Like if you're screwing in a bunch of fans, it's literally half a turn and it's in, half a turn and it's in. I don't know why no one else has thought of this. And another thing on that, all the fan screws that came with this chassis were white. So I'm actually thinking about picking some of these up for other builds. Like I've always been looking for white fan screws, especially if you're doing going into the back here, there's nothing worse than you put your fans in on a white chassis and you've got all those little black fan screws on the back. So just having them white is also a nice feature as well. I would probably say the only issue I had with this whole build, the only sort of encounter I had was once I set this all up, I cannot get the top IO lighting to work in IQ and the front Corsair logo. Now I mentioned that earlier that it should show up in the IQ software, the 9000D shows up and you can configure the 18 LEDs for the top, V4 for that Corsair logo. Now when I turn the system on, they light up, default rainbow RGB. When the system post goes into Windows, they shut off. Now I'm not sure why that is, um, I backtracked and everything's connected fine, everything is how I can see. The only thing I can think of is as soon as I installed uh, IQ, I updated the firmware on both of my controllers. So maybe because this case is so new that only the stock firmware that came with the chassis supported the 9000D in the software. And because I've updated to the latest firmware, they might not have added that in yet, but I'm sure that'll be fixed uh, pretty soon. I'll reach out to them about that and let them know. Now, lastly, I do want to talk about this build because you're probably wondering what the hell is going on here and what is all the hardware I use. So first off, the CPU is a Threadripper 7970X right in the middle there. Now, when I was uh, contacted to do this build, Corsair reached out and said, hey, I think they said they only have three samples hit in the US basically on launch. Do I want to do it? I was like, hell yeah, of course. I love my big cases. So I tried to look for the biggest motherboard I could that was white and this is what I could find. This was all I could find. And this is the Gigabyte Aero, the TRX50 Aero, and that is the Threadripper board. So I reached out to a Gigabyte, they sent me that board, shout out to them for that. I reached out to AMD for the Threadripper CPU, they sent that, shout out for them for sending that. And then I had to work down the list and go for some memory. Now, Threadripper and Xeon, the latest platforms, you can't use your standard UDIM, you have to use RDIM. So I reached out to ADATA for some RDIM and they sent that as well. So I wanna shout out to them for sending that. So basically we got the Threadripper board, the Threadripper, 128 gig of RDIM. Now the memory heat sinks on that, a lot of RDIM just comes completely naked. These modules are actually green, it is hard to see. I don't really mind it because it's only the edge that you see and you can't really tell they're green. If I had no heat sinks on these memory modules at all, it'd probably be an eyesore because you would see the green, old green PCB. So 
These heat spreaders are bits power. I've used them before in a Xeon build. These are the bits power LN2 sides that the LN2 pot is meant to go on. Now, you don't have to use the pot. You can just use the sides on their own. They don't get very hot. And I think the aesthetic of all of this just matches perfectly. You've got the silver on the VRM heat sinks. You've got the nice matte silver or the anodized silver on these uh, memory modules and now the CPU block. Now, when I do a build for a certain company, say it's Corsair, Thermaltake, Lian Li, if they do water cooling or fans, I try to keep it all the same brand. I don't like to mix too many brands when I'm doing my case reviews, but unfortunately, I couldn't go Corsair for the CPU block because they don't do a Threadripper block. So this is the Optimus water cooling. Now, this thing is a monster. This is their signature V3 block, and it is 1.5 kilograms in weight. Now, for you Americans, that's 3.2 pounds. Now, that thing is an absolute beast. So I got that in there, and that also matches this board and the rest of the system as well. So we've got Threadripper, Gigabyte, ADATA, Optimus, and then the rest is all Corsair. Corsair uh, fans, these are their newer LX120s. I like these because the RGB is simple. It's just one line, it looks nice, it's not oversaturated, and then you have the fan blade illumination as well. Radiators are Hydro Labs. Unfortunately, Corsair do good rads. Well, they're basically the OEM, which are Hydro Labs they do a lot of different sizes, but they just don't do that many in white. So unfortunately, I had to go full hardware labs directly for the white ones for that. And then the rest is all Corsair. We have those two pump res combos I talked about. All the fittings are Corsairs. Silver, I was kind of contemplating, do I do their white fittings or do I do silver? So I decided to do silver just to give it a bit of a contrast because there is a lot of white going on with this build. Then I thought, hey, what the heck? Let's throw in not one, but two 4090s to try and fill out this system. So these are the Corsair blocks. Now I've used these in a recent build a little while ago for the GPU. Unfortunately, they do not come in white either. So I had to strip them down, take the back plate off, take the bottom off, take the terminal off, paint it all, put it all back together. And I think it just ties in nicely. And then I re-added the bit of their logo design back on each of the back plates with my vinyl cutter. Now these here are Corsair's own right angle, probably not right angle, I would say 180 degree 12 volt high power connectors. I didn't even know they did these. And a the cool thing is you get one pack that is black and white. So it's got a little rubber cover. So it comes with the black one installed and this comes in the box as well. And you can just stick that on like so. And it just turns it from the black one to the white one. Now that's gonna probably be impossible to get back on, but it does go on nice and snug. So it doesn't, uh, fall off but yeah dual 4090s in this build because yep what the heck let's fill it out and then below that i've also added a quad m.2 card as well because this is threadripper i can do four ssds on the motherboard it does three gen 5 one gen 4 and then that's a bottom slot was locked at gen 4 but it was a full 16 so i can bifurcate that bottom card and i can do by four by four by four by four for those four corsair Gen 4 SSD, so that would make a monster system. And then if you watch the time that's build video, I'll do on this in probably a few days, will come out after this video. I actually jam packed the hard drive cage as well, because I thought if you're going with a uh, workstation uh, build like this, all of these drives are completely free. You're not losing them. A lot of cases that if you deck it out with radiators or other things, you normally have to remove the hard drive base and sacrifice it for something else. But this one, these are all empty, so I thought, hey, what the heck, let's put uh, five 16 terabyte mechanical hard drives down. I know some of you guys will be like, who uses those these days? But they're still good for a backup option. You've basically got like a NAS inside, or you could call it a DAS inside your PC. You've got your high speed storage on the motherboard. Uh, they were all four terabytes. What was that? Eight, four terabytes. And then you've got the 16 by five in there for some backup redundant storage. But that's it on the build. I don't want to talk too long on this, but it is an absolute monster. You can probably see how much higher this case is than me just sitting down at this desk. Now for the price, for the 9,000D, it's gonna retail for 499 US dollars, and that is in the black or the white variant. So that's not as bad as what I thought it was going to be. The 1,000D, I think when that launched was more than that. So 499, not too bad. Now, in terms of who this case is for, if you have a 1,000D and you're watching this and you're thinking, hmm, should I upgrade? Now, if you've already got a sick custom loop, you've got some pretty decent uh, high-end hardware, you're not looking at going back connect, stick with your 1000D. 
The main changes for this chassis, it's got uh, back connect and it has the upgraded infinity rails, which are really, really sweet. And then, then you are getting that 360 spot around the back and that steel side panel. So if you're looking for a super tower, uh, definitely 9000D is gonna be the case for you. You'll fit any radiators you can throw at it. And then I said, it's got that back connect, huge PSU support, and then the cable management around the rear is pretty much endless as well. But um, I think that's it for this video. I don't want it to drag on for too long, which it probably already has. I want to thank Corsair for sending this out to review. I know that only had a very few samples, so I am pretty stoked about that. I want to thank the other sponsors for contributing to all this hardware. And I want to thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.